Hello, and welcome to UAN How to Organize Your Files. These are the tips for organization, not requirements. Other methods may be used. Consider the paperwork that comes into the hands of the fiscal officer and how it will flow through time. I don't want you to get buried under the paperwork. The records have to be maintained for the proper time period. What do I mean by that? Well, keep your records during the current fiscal year so they're easily accessed for daily work. At year end, you file most of the year's records and store them for the next audit. And then once audited, they're moved into storage and are separated and maintained according to your records retention schedule. Some of you have a scheduled process to scan and store documents electronically. Others organize them in physical files in boxes. Your retention schedule should dictate how the files are separated and stored on a long-term basis so they can be easily located. Because all three of these time periods require different organization and access to the material, it's best to organize the current year records so they flow easily into audit and storage. If you don't have a records retention schedule, you should organize the storage of records so a public records request can be quickly addressed. I'm going to start right in with the types of documents that come your way during the year along with the recommended method of filing. You should have a file for computer software that has been purchased or licensed for use. For example, the UAN user agreement or a license for utility billing software. Auditors will confirm you have these software agreements. These files won't move out of your current year work until you no longer have the software. Then it moves to audit and on to storage. In this file folder, keep your user or license agreements, correspondence with the company, website username and passwords, it's always handy to write those on the inside of the file on the left side. Remember that files that contain login information should always be kept in a locked file cabinet. Make sure you have a secure location for files with sensitive material. Ohio government entities must have certified resources available. The auditor needs to review certifications and what you entered in your books as revenue budgets. In order to pull these pieces together for easy access during your work year and for the audit, I recommend you create an annual resources available file. At the beginning of each year, you send the county auditor the certificate of the total amount from all sources available for expenditures and balances. A copy goes in the file. Include the carryover encumbrance details. That's going to be audited. Include the cover letters to the county auditor and any amended certificates and the revenue budget reports that confirm you have the same numbers in it in your software. This completes the resources available file. Now let's discuss the appropriations file. The auditor is going to need to confirm that your board adopted appropriation legislation and it's what you entered in your bookkeeping as appropriation budgets. In order to pull these pieces together for easy access during your work year and for audit, I recommend you create an annual appropriation file. In the file, you always place a copy of all appropriation legislation. The original, of course, will be kept with the adopted legislation. Keep a copy of the appropriation budget report to verify the figures of the legislation will match your software entries. Include all cover letters to the county auditor sending a copy of the legislation. They must be notified when changes take place. Include all certificates from the county auditor certifying that you haven't over-appropriated. Not all counties issue these certificates. If yours does, keep the certification in this file. And when changes to the appropriations take place by adopted legislation, supplemental or reallocation outside the legal level of control, place a copy in this file along with the supplemental appropriation report. Keeping your appropriations organized this way keeps it convenient during the fiscal year and allows the auditors to review all changes to the appropriations quickly and efficiently. Keep a separate file for reallocations within the fiscal officer's legal level of control. These do not require board adopted legislation, but the auditor needs to verify you haven't reallocated outside your authorized level. Print a supplemental appropriation report showing the decreased and increased appropriation accounts which verify you haven't crossed your limit, making it quick and easy for the auditor to confirm the legal level of control was followed. Each year you start working on the operating budget for the upcoming year. 
The budget file for the new year can be opened the first time somebody stops in your office and says, hey, we want to buy a mower next year. You can make a note that they want to plan for the mower and are getting an estimate for you. You keep adding notes to the file until it's finally time to prepare and file the budget. Place a copy of the proof of publication of the budget hearing in the file, and once the tax budget has been adopted, the file copy is placed in the folder. It's always a good idea to have a copy of the format you filed and an expanded format by revenue and appropriation accounts and the footnotes that are good for the fiscal officer. Later, the county auditor certifies and sends you back a copy with the official certificate. You'll need quick access to this document when preparing the revenue budgets and temporary appropriations in the new year. The keeping of your minutes will be very important. The best option is the pre-numbered paged minutes book with post binders. Sheets can be removed, run through your printer, and then returned to the binder. If a pre-numbered page is damaged by printer errors, you never discard them, but you mark a line through and write printer error and continue printing on the next pre-numbered page. These books cost about $150 to $200, so entities on a tight budget may not be able to afford this option. Printing your minutes on plain paper and keeping them in a three-ring binder is acceptable. The trouble with this option is when minutes are taken out of the binder to be copied, they have to be put back in in the proper order. A couple of tips can make this option better. Use a header on each page to identify the entity name and meeting date and use a footer at the bottom of the page with the page number of number pages, like 1 of 10. This method assures the minutes pages can be put back in the proper order. Let's talk about how to keep documentation for the notice of public meetings. The Ohio Sunshine Law requires the governing board to establish a policy for notifying the public of all meetings, regular, committee, special, and emergency. In addition, you may have individuals or members of the press that have requested notice of all meetings via telephone, email, or fax. You need to document how you followed the law and your local policy for notifications for all meetings. Notifications of the general public usually involves the posting of a notice in specific places in the community or an ad in the local newspaper. The posted notice usually contains the date, time, location, and agenda for the meeting. You should create a posting and notice log so someone at the location where you're posting can sign off on the date and time you hung the meeting notice. And you can check off all the other notifications. For example, if you have a list of press or private citizens that must be notified via fax, email, or phone, print and file a copy of all the notices sent, enter the phone calls made, and messages left by date and time. If your minutes are kept in the three ring binder, it would be easy to place the notice, agenda, and posting logs in the minutes binder. But if you have the pre-numbered page minutes books, you may need to keep a separate file. Make sure you have a list of all the procedures to follow and you document how they were followed for all of your public meetings. There are two types of legislation adopted by Ohio governments. Resolutions, used by all entity types, and ordinances used only by villages. Since villages use both types and they do not serve the same purpose or have the same meeting, villages should maintain separate resolution and ordinance books. Common options are the resolution and ordinance post books. They're very like the minutes books discussed earlier. Pre-numbered pages are not as necessary in these books and they can be very confusing when legislation is introduced at an earlier meeting and not adopted until a later date. The post book option allows you to purchase blank pages to run through your printer then insert into the book. And again, these books cost about $150 to $200. Another option is to use the plain paper and a three ring binder for your legislation. Regardless of the filing method used, always include a header with the entity name, date adopted, and legislation number, and a footer with page number, one of ten, for example, and then when the pages are removed for copying, they can be easily put back in the proper order. Software backups should be often and organized. Keep your end of year and your first of year backups off site, and rotate your last My Documents and last software backups off site. 
If you don't keep backups in a separate location, they will be burnt, flooded, or stolen with the computer, and you will have nothing to restore in case of an emergency. You should also keep a backup log, noting the date, time, disk or flash drive identity, and the description of the backup point in your work. Always backup after posting a large volume of work, such as bills paid, payroll posted, after the bank reconciliation, large items like that. Rotate 5 to 10 disks or flash drives in case one fails. If you use flash drives, purchase different colors or use a sharpie and assign a number or letter to each device so they can be easily rotated and logged. If you use CDs or DVDs, assign a number or a letter to each disk so they can be rotated and logged. When a disk is full, write full in the date and put it on the disk peg with the other full disks. Your retention schedule establishes when old backups can be destroyed. You are required to provide monthly financial statements to the governing board. You should keep a copy of what you provided to the governing board for the auditor to review. The governing board should sign off on the copy at the meeting to show they've received their copy and accepted statements as presented. Since many of the reports are on legal size paper, I recommend a legal size three ring binder for the monthly financial reports. You can purchase pre-drilled legal size paper to put in the printer. And if you don't have the money to purchase the legal size binders, they're a little more expensive than the regular size binders. Keep a file folder for monthly financial statements. The auditor will be able to review the reports presented and approved by signature. Let's talk about the monthly bank statements. I recommend that you file the monthly bank statements with check images along with the bank reconciliation report signed by the governing board. I recommend a three ring binder or using one of those 12 month accordion files so each month is separated. Receipts should be filed in numerical order with documentation stapled to the receipt. Attach documentation so it can be easily viewed by auditors without unstapling. You want to use a filing system that will hold the receipt and the backup documentation in place but make it easy to access. So I recommend a three ring binder, arch board, or file folder. And if you aren't familiar with the term archboard, they look like a clipboard but they have the rings like a binder. Smaller entities would find these less expensive than binders and they would hold an entire year of receipts. Memo receipts are used to post gross revenue minus fees for a net distribution and are most often used for tax distributions from the county, state, local taxes, and court fines. The auditor is always going to verify that you have posted your tax revenue and fees to the correct funds. You can either let the auditor dig through all your receipts to find those items, remember they're numbered sequentially with the other receipts, or you can make it easy by printing a second copy of the memo receipt and file it separate from the original receipt with the distribution sheet. Use a separate tab in your receipts binder or arch border file with these duplicates. In this way, the auditor can quickly complete the review of your tax distributions. After audit, the second copy with distribution sheets can be placed with the original receipt and all receipts go into storage together. Payments made by check, also known as warrants, should be kept in sequential order in a month. The voucher portion of the stub should be on top and the invoice statement or sales slip should be stapled under the voucher in the upper left corner so the auditor can see the data on the stub and compare it to the documentation attached. Don't fold and staple items so they have to be unstapled to be verified. Remember that voided checks are placed in sequential order with the others. Be sure to properly void a check by marking clearly void across the check and cutting out the signature block. Do not file payments by vendor. This makes it difficult and time consuming for auditors to verify payments and check for missing warrants. Payments not made by check are considered electronic payments and they produce paper vouchers when posted. The paper vouchers should always be kept in sequential order in a month. They can be kept with the warrants. The electronic payment voucher should be on top and the invoice statement or sales slip should be stapled under the voucher in the upper left corner so the auditor can see the data on the voucher and easily lift to compare it to the documentation attached. Don't fold and staple items so they have to be unstapled to be verified. 
Vouchers that are later voided are still placed in sequential order. Simply mark them void so the auditor can verify there are no missing vouchers. The UAN payroll software uses a sequential voucher number for wage postings to the cash journal. You can generate the payroll posting detail report for each month and tuck it in with the electronic vouchers for easy audit verification. The filing methods for payments differ based on the monthly volume of the entity. Small entities can easily use a monthly tabbed accordion folder. Many entities are going to fit into this category and the entire year's payments will fit very tidy. However, larger entities would fill that in one month, so they may want to use an expanding file pocket for each month's payments. Choose the method that best suits your entity size. Be mindful of whether you have sensitive information attached as documentation. Do you have police officer's address, any social security numbers with your payments? If so, make sure you're keeping the payments folder in a secured location such as a locking filed cabinet. Moving forward, you should no longer keep sensitive information with the payments, but consider how to move those items to a better file that can be secured while leaving enough documentation with the payments to satisfy the auditor. Purchase orders and blanket certificates should be kept separate in numerical order in a binder or on an archboard. Requisition forms, quotes, and estimates can be filed with the PO. Don't put the PO or blanket certificate with the payment. The auditor has to verify the purchase orders. If they aren't in sequential order, it will make it more difficult and time consuming to audit. Remember, they check the voucher stub or electronic payment voucher and it contains the POBC number and the appropriation account allocation. It isn't necessary to file the original or a copy of the PO with the payment. Separate the department inventories into their own files, but keep them together by year until they're audited. Once audited, the department folders are placed with the past department inventories rather than together by year. Keep the files that contain correspondence with your attorney separate from general correspondence, and keep these files secure. You will need to understand the public records laws and understand who may have access to these documents. You may want a file pocket with separate files for correspondence, legislation, policies, or other subjects that the attorney provides advice. Lawsuits or specific disputes should have their own files that are also kept secure. Keep separate files for each insurance policy, such as liability, health, dental, vision, like that. Upon renewal, start a new file with the policy effective dates on the outside or on the file tab. Policies stay available for the audit years within the effective date. Your entity will have several different policies like the ones populating the screen. You should always keep them in three ring binders or in booklet form. Make sure you're numbering the pages if they're in three ring binders. Make sure you keep documentation on the policy effective dates and you should note the legislation number for policy adoption and changes. Be sure to keep outdated policies. Auditors will need to review old policies to see if they were followed during the audit period and review updated policies. Village and townships and any special districts that have elected governing board members should always maintain a Board of Elections file. The fiscal officer must certify to the Board of Elections the swearing in of all newly elected or appointed elected officials and the term of office they have taken. A copy of each letter to the Board of Elections should be kept in this file. Use this file to keep track of all the unexpired terms of office for any appointments or newly elected officials. Levies that your governing board has placed on the ballot should have its own file folder or a file drawer with individual files for each levy. I recommend that you write on the outside of the file the following information. The date it was voted in, the expiration date, the first tax year, the first collection year. This makes levies easy to audit and easy to review to see which ones need to be placed on the ballot when they're coming up for renewal. Place a copy of all legislation associated with the levy into the file and all correspondence with the Board of Elections regarding the levy. The bond of officials can mean two different items. Some entities have a bond book 
used for documenting the swearing in of all officials. Use the book as required for swearing in new members and keeping track of terms of office. Bonds can also refer to the insurance policies for individuals that handle money for the entity. These bonds are specific to individuals that are insured against theft in office and should be kept in individual files but grouped together in the same file pocket or drawer in a cabinet. Bonds generally run by term of office for elected officials and by year for employees, but not always. File all correspondence and collections against a bond in the individual bond files. You should keep a file for each memorandum in agreement for deposit of public funds. When the agreement is renewed with a banking institution, open a new file. You can write the effective dates on the outside of the folder. The expired agreements must go through audit before they're sent to storage. Your banking institutions that hold over the FDIC insured amount should have pledged securities and should provide you with regular statements of those pledged securities. You should have pledged securities files for each depository and contract period. Keep these files near the depository agreement files. Investments should be kept in separate files, one for each investment. Include documentation of the account for audit, note if it's pooled, non-pooled, what the interest rate is, reinvested or post to primary, and the maturity date. Upon maturity, update the file indicating if it was rolled over or cashed and when rolled over, an investment receives a new account number and you open a new file. It is a new investment. Bequest files. We most often see these for cemeteries and libraries. Someone has donated money, often with strings attached, and each bequest should have its own file and should contain a copy of the will or trust documents that governs the use of the money. Write on the inside of the file the non-spendable amount and the allowable use of the spendable amount. Document whether the money is for private purpose or to support the entity's operations. If there are no files on the existing funds that you already have, you can search back through the old records finding the minutes or prior cash journals when the bequest was received and the fund created. Build the files if they don't currently exist. Remember your legal advisor may have a copy of these documents. You should have a file on all vehicle and major equipment. Each item should have its own file. Note the allocation by fund of the purchase price. When this equipment is sold years later, you have to divide the sale proceeds by the same percentage by fund as the original purchase. Put a copy of the title in the file. The original title should be kept in a more secure location such as a safety deposit box or fireproof safe. And if the vehicle requires gratis plates, you can keep the registration documentation in this file. Secondary files which may be kept by the department heads instead of the fiscal officer should include vehicle inspection forms and the maintenance records and copies of invoices for outsourced work. Miscellaneous correspondence is often thrown into a file folder with no organization, and this is just not acceptable. It doesn't make any sense to open a new file for every letter you receive, but we've got to have a better way to do this. I recommend an A through Z accordion file for miscellaneous correspondence. Little matters that don't need an individual file can go into the miscellaneous folder filed by last name of an individual or the first word in a company name. This file can be added to over several years and would only need to be closed and replaced with a new accordion file when it was full. It will go into storage after the closing year has been audited and it's kept into storage with all other general correspondence per your retention schedule. This method makes it easy to find any letter during a range of years. If you have a system in place to document and address resident complaints, you should keep these separate from the general correspondence, but you could keep them organized in a resident complaint A to Z accordion file. Unless your system of addressing complaints through different departments would require an individual file to be opened. All correspondence, internal memos, call notes, and documentation as to how the situation was resolved should be in the file with the original complaint. The manner you keep them, accordion folder or individual files, will dictate how they move through audit and storage. 
Email has become the normal form of correspondence for many entities, and you must consider these public records. If you don't have a records retention schedule that tells you how to manage emails, you cannot delete them. If your records retention schedule addresses emails, follow the required procedures. I recommend that you print emails and place them in the proper file. For example, emails to and from the attorney would go in the legal files. From the insurance agent would go in the insurance files. Emails from residents into the miscellaneous correspondence file. If you don't put a copy in the file, how is anyone but you going to be able to see the correspondence that often leads to decisions made by the governing board? If you haven't already taken the Certified Public Records training, be sure to schedule your training as soon as possible so you understand the significance of email communications as a public record. This is especially important if you're using a personal email address for government entity communications. Discuss with your legal advisor and an IT specialist about how emails from your personal account can be preserved. How will these records be accessed by future fiscal officers when you're no longer associated with the government entity? You should have a separate file for each debt. The file should contain the original loan documents. Write on the outside of the folder the date entered into, the total amount, the interest rate, and always staple the amortization schedule on the inside of the file on the left side. The amortization schedule is the list of payments due for principal and interest until the loan is repaid. This information is needed for every tax budget, annual financial report, and audit. You want the information readily available so it's not a burden to locate the debt details. Keep all your debt files together and keep them in your active records until paid in full. When the loan is paid off, the file remains available until the final payment has been audited and then it's sent to storage. Let's talk about grants. Each grant should be kept in a separate file that contains the grant application. If other department heads are sending in these applications, they need to provide the fiscal officer with a copy. You would also place in the file the award or denial letters. All correspondence, maybe instructions for reimbursements or pay request submissions. And if you want to make it very easy to audit, include copies of the grant receipts, copies of invoices, and payment reports with the grant file. Let's talk about how to manage contracts with vendors. At the very least, each vendor should have a file containing the contract or agreement, the completed W-9 form with their business name, and tax ID, certificates of insurance, and confirmation that they have no state lanes. Bid documents need to be kept together so they can be quickly audited. Keep these documents separated from the rest of your project files for audit purposes. Make sure the file contains a copy of the bid specifications, the bid packet that was given to the contractors, the proof of publication, the list of bids received and opened along with the bid amounts, and to round out the file, you can put a copy of the minutes of the meeting where the contract was awarded and any copy of legislation adopted for that purpose, at the very least, the date of the meeting and the legislation number, so the auditor can quickly check these items. Construction projects can have an overwhelming flow of paperwork that needs to be organized. You should separate some of the specific items so they can be quickly audited or reviewed by someone overseeing the project. Some of the files you may need to establish for your project are contracts, correspondence, pay requests and payment notifications, change orders, prevailing wage, and of course, as described just a few minutes ago, the bid documents. You may also have a loan and grant documents that are part of this project. And remember, those loans and grants need to have a separate file. The loan file will remain open until it's paid in full and audited. Once this project has been audited, the files go into storage together. The loan file can join the other project files once it's paid and completely audited. I've seen large projects with all these documents thrown in a box with no order for the auditor to sort through. That would not be a good plan. Keep your projects organized. I recommend creating an audit file. You can make one for each year or keep two years together for the biannual audit. No one can remember every mistake they made or how they corrected it after two years. 
So keep the notes on corrections that will need explanation along with the backup documentation, perhaps legal opinions, Ohio Revised Code sections, and memos outlining the mistake, how you determine the method of correction, the posting dates of the corrections. When the auditor arrives, go over these items so they don't miss your corrections in a mistake they may find. This makes the audit so much easier for you. Also include in the audit file the paperwork generated by the audit letters, time and cost estimates, emails, outlines, questionnaires, documents from the post-audit conference, and responses to any findings and the final audit, of course. The audit committee file should contain the items the committee reviewed, solutions to problems, and recommendations for change. Any correspondence between the audit committee and other key employees would need to be included. The auditor will want to review the minutes of the audit committee meetings, of course those are kept with your other minutes, and any documentation the committee reviewed or prepared for the next audit. Personnel files should always be kept in a secure location. You must be mindful of protecting the personal information of the personnel. Examples of what each file may contain when relevant are the W-4 and IT-4 forms and other withholding related material. The date hired or appointed and if they're filling an elected position, their term of office. A copy of the oath of office, if not in book form, not everyone's going to have this. The rate of pay and copy of the minutes or legislation that sets that rate of pay. Just put a copy in the file. Disciplinary action per your policies and resignation or termination information. Now let's talk about how to file your payroll records. By this I mean the time cards and documentation for each paycheck. When you print the paycheck, the voucher stubs should be filed with the monthly checks, but you should never put the time cards with the monthly checks. Time cards are more of a permanent record while the payment vouchers and invoices are more temporary. You do not want to mix the two together. Place the voucher stub with the warrants and keep a separate payroll filing system for the time cards. This makes it easy to quickly view all time cards and wages. I suggest you use a payroll binder, files, or arch boards. Separate them by employees with tabs. The entire year records by paycheck date are kept in the binder. Time cards are kept in this filing system. Be careful not to punch holes in the data. You may need to staple the time card to a report. If you have internal leave request forms, they should be filed with the time card the leave is paid. And include the wage detail report to make it easy for the auditor to verify the time card against each wage paid. Filing payroll records by employee in this manner will make them easy to audit and easy to separate the records by employee when they go into storage. Let's talk about payroll withholdings. Every year make a new file for each withholding payee, federal, state, school tax, local taxes, Ohio Public Employees Retirement, Ohio Police and Fire Pension Fund if you have them. ODJFS, Department of Job and Family Services, etc. Make a copy of all the monthly or quarterly reports and keep them in these files. You always want to keep a copy of the payment confirmations when you make online payments and note the voucher number. Remember the withholding payment voucher is going to be included with your payment file with the warrants in sequential order. You should make a copy or print two so the withholding payments can be quickly audited. When you make an online payment, always print the payment confirmation page and put it with the voucher in the withholding file. Any correspondence or corrections should be kept in the file and this will make it easy to reconcile the W-2 report with the total withholdings reported and paid during the year and it's certainly easy for audit. Keep these files in a secure location as some of them contain personal information. Do not file tax and retirement reports with the monthly payments. This makes them difficult to find and audit and places sensitive material with the unsecured records. It will make the records more difficult to find once they go into storage. You should have an Ohio New Hire file. File the copies of employee new hire forms or print the verification of each new hire reported online. The file can remain open for many years rather than one year depending on your hire rate. 
Keep this file in a secure location with your withholding reports, making it easy for you to access, audit, and store with other employee sensitive materials. You should have an IRS I-9 form file. The I-9 form is Employment Eligibility Verification Forms. You should have an I-9 with submitted documentation for each employee. These forms should never be kept in the employee's personnel file. The IRS will penalize you if they find these forms filed improperly. The file can be kept by year or one file can continue for many years depending on your staff size. Keep this file in a secure location. Unemployment claims, invoices, and documentation should always be kept separate from the quarterly ODJFS wage reports with withholding files. While you may attach documentation to the payment records, you should keep the unemployment file with the records of invoices and payments as well, making it easy to audit and easy to review claims from prior years without digging through a year of payments. You should have a new W-2 file each year. Keep any notes on manual edits for auditors to review. The file should contain the employer copy of the W-2s and the W-3. And if you are one of those few entities that were required to file the 1094 or 1095 forms, you can keep them in the W-2 file or keep them in the same area with the W-2 file so they can be easily audited. If you have any vendors that received a 1099, you should have a 1099 file each year as well. The file should contain the entity copy of the 1099s and the 1096 forms. Last but not least, you need to keep a continuing education file. Document all training taken or all waivers for training not required. File by audit period, by year, or by term of office. However, you're going to track your training hours. Make sure you keep track of all online trainings, the name of the training, the date taken, the time spent. This will help you be prepared to self-report at year end. The auditor will be able to confirm you have met your continuing education requirements. This completes the How to Organize Your Files video. I hope this information is helpful.